I'm going to give an overview of my philosophy ideas. We learn about reality by critical thinking and critical discussion. We make many mistakes, but we can find and fix them. Reason is about actively looking for errors and making improvements. The emphasis here is not on observation, as some people would think it should be. Observations are useful because you can use them to criticize things. You can say, this idea doesn't match this observation, so that's a criticism. But observations do not guide us to the truth by themselves. They're just a tool. Some people would think this is too negative, but it's important to look for bad things. You can't just focus on what you think is good and gloss over what the problems are. We don't know what the ideal is. We don't know what's perfect. But what we do know is here are some ways that this thing sucks. And if you look for more of those, you can find more ways to make it better. And when you find a good trait, something you think, this is why I like this one, it should translate into a criticism of rival ideas. If all of the alternatives have the same good trait, then it doesn't get you anything. But if some of the alternatives are missing that good trait, then you can criticize them for not having it. So it only a good trait only differentiates things when some of them have it and some don't, so you can criticize some of them. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. It's about how we learn, how we think, how we get knowledge. How we evaluate knowledge, which ideas are good or bad. It's the most important field because it's used by every other field. It deals with the methods of thinking and learning. So in every other field, you have to think about things, you have to learn things, you have to evaluate, like, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Is this true or false? And the way you do all those things is with epistemology. It's the uh, intellectual tool for dealing with ideas. Epistemology is not like a specific opinion on how to deal with ideas. It's just the name of the field in general for any approach to dealing with ideas. My epistemology, my approach to dealing with ideas, has various features. For example, I believe that objective reality exists, and I think for every unambiguous question, there's a true answer. There's a, a truth of the matter about various issues. Not two truths, not three truths, not zero truths. One truth per issue. When it looks like there's more truths, it's because the issue is not specified enough. When you have ambiguity, so the, the problem could mean multiple different things. You know, if someone asks an ambiguous question, then there's more than one answer depending on how you take it. So not only is there an objective reality, but we can know things about it. We observe reality. We deal with reality. We touch things that are real objects. So we have understanding of reality. It's not perfect. We're fallible. We make mistakes. But we can improve. We're not doomed to any particular mistake. Anything that we're getting wrong right now about reality, uh, we can make progress and fix that. So there's no limit on how good our understanding of reality can be. There's no limit on how connected our ideas can be to reality. I reject uh, magic and religion, so your house is not haunted, you're not psychic, you don't have telepathy, you can't bend spoons with your mind, uh, you don't have bad luck, good luck charms don't work, you know, etc, etc, all that stuff. I don't hate religion. Some religions have some decent moral advice, you know, don't murder people. Don't steal things. And there's a lot more detail than that. And even non-religious people use a lot of uh, common sense moral ideas that were created in the past when almost everyone was religious, and they were built up in a religious society, and they have connections to religion still. And I don't want to throw all that out just because God doesn't exist. But God does not exist. That is magical thinking.
lots of religious ideas, and also myths, like the old Greek stories, have some good ideas in them, like they have some point to them. Like they can show you things about life and how people act. But if you try to treat them as scientific truth, you will be wrong. Some of the key parts of reason are understanding that we make mistakes and we need criticism to deal with mistakes. Criticisms are explanations of errors. Why does this idea fail to solve the problem it is supposed to solve or accomplish the goal it is supposed to accomplish? Why does this idea not work? What's wrong with it? That's a criticism. A criticism is not flaming, insulting, attacking, saying something sucks, or contradicting it, or just saying no. A criticism is actually giving reasoning about what's wrong with something. So explaining the error instead of just asserting there is an error or that you don't like it. So that helps us because in order to fix errors, we need to figure out what they are and get some understanding of them. And then we can think of uh, what we can do about them. And that's the basic way progress happens. There's no way to just jump straight to the truth. Instead, we make guesses about what would be a good idea. We brainstorm things. We, we come up with all kinds of ideas, and most of them don't work. It's kind of a trial and error process. But it's not just empirical trials. Those are good, but it's also intellectual trials. We uh, try out our ideas in critical debate, and we expose them to attempted criticisms, and we see if they survive or not. Can they stand up to criticism? Can they, can they stand up to intellectual scrutiny? And if they can't, can we fix them? Can we improve them? Or do we need a different idea? So the basic formula for learning is brainstorm solutions to problems. You have to have some sort of goal first. You start with like a goal, a problem, something you're trying to understand, figure out, accomplish. You don't just like have ideas with no context. There has to be a context, um, some purpose for the ideas. So purpose comes first. Brainstorming comes second. You try to come up with what might be some solutions, some answers, some relevant ideas. Brainstorming is not just make things up or random. You can do some of that. Like you can be imaginative, creative, whatever. But you can also you know, go read a book and look up information on the topic to get some ideas. Any way of getting ideas is fine. So brainstorming is not a perfect word. You could call it gathering ideas from any sources. Not all sources are equal, but none of them are like 100% off limits. Um, the use of sources or the methodology for how you gather ideas is itself open to criticism and error correction. It's an area where we can make progress. And then once we have ideas, so we have a purpose, and then we have ideas that are trying to deal with that purpose, then the next step is criticism. We analyze the ideas. We try to look for reasons they won't work, uh, things that are wrong with them, ways they're broken, ways they'll fail. Looking for good traits of ideas also helps, because if you find this idea has a good trait, you can look at which of the other ideas are missing that good trait, and you can find, you can rule out some of the ideas that way. But if two ideas both have a good trait, then you can't differentiate them with it. You don't want to say, I like this idea because it has this good trait, and then you ignore a hundred other ideas that also have the same good trait. So you, you have to think about like all the ideas in front of you instead of paying selective attention based on positive attributes. You don't want to be biased. And so learning is a, an ongoing process. There isn't really an end point. You, you use uh, criticisms of the ideas, and you evaluate them, and you make a judgment call. There's no um, perfect answer that you just can't go wrong with. There's no follow all the instructions and get the right answer. You have to think for yourself, use your judgment, and try to understand the issue and do your best. And if you don't do so well, uh, you can try to figure out what you did wrong and improve it for the future. And there's a bunch of guidance and things that can help you, but there's no uh, simple way, there's no silver bullet, there's no simple way to always get the right answer. 
you have to think for yourself. You can't just follow instructions without thinking and be an effective reasoner. And it's also, it's up to you where to stop. Like, how good of an idea do you want? What's good enough to solve your problem for now and let you move on? That's up to you. You know, you can just do a little bit of brainstorming and a little bit of criticism and say, this isn't very important, I'm going to stop now and move on. That's fine. But then if it's more important, you can put more work into it. And you can go back and forth. After you criticize a bunch, you can brainstorm some more. Because now you'll have a new perspective on the issue. And anyways, once you're done, you have some sort of solution, but you may in the future decide that it is lacking in some way and you want to revisit it and reopen the problem and try to improve it further. So this is all an evolutionary process. It's evolutionary in the sort of standard metaphorical sense that we're building up better and better things. There's a, a gradual step-by-step -step improvement. You know, we do a little brainstorming criticism, we fix a few errors, and then later we do a bit more, and then later we do a bit more, and and then I tell my idea to someone else, and he improves it, and then he tells it to someone else, and they improve it. You know, there's also the group effort to improving ideas. So things get better and better, and we build up better ideas, and that's kind of how the history of science has worked. But there's another aspect of evolution. Our learning is literally evolution. Evolution is the one and only known answer to how knowledge can be created. So in exactly the same way that genes evolve, ideas also can evolve. The logic of how they work is identical. The underlying logic is replication, variation, and selection. That's why genetic evolution works. The genes are able to replicate themselves. The copies have variation between them. They're not all identical. And some of those variations are improvements. Most aren't, but some are. And then there's selection. The ones that are errors die out on average. And the result is adaptation to a purpose. In the case of genes, it's roughly along the lines of having a lot of grandchildren. Survival and replication. Humans can decide their own purposes. They can adapt and evolve ideas to solve problems they came up with. You decide you want an idea for a particular purpose, like you want to answer a question. You brainstorm many ideas. You vary those ideas. You're creating an idea pool, just like a gene pool, and then you apply selection to it. The criticism removes the ideas that aren't good enough, that don't work. And even if this isn't done perfectly, if it's done somewhat effectively, then the result is if you iterate on this a bit, you get ideas that are more and more adapted to the purpose. You know, you get answers that fit the question better. The question of how knowledge can be created from non-knowledge is very hard. Um, people have seen that it's hard in the case of biological evolution. There have never been any other answers besides evolution that were very good. You know, creationism is not a good answer. God made it. God did it. Well, where did the complexity of God come from? You know, it doesn't... That's just passing the buck. It's saying... Well, all the knowledge about how to make animals just came from God, who had it somehow. It's just saying it was already there for some reason. So where can it actually come from originally? Like, how can it come into existence when it didn't already exist? Like, where can eyes come from without an intelligent designer that already knows how to design eyes? That kind of problem is very hard, and there are no other answers to it. And I'll say more about that when I get to induction. So the basic point of ideas is problem solving. We're trying to improve our lives, accomplish our purposes, make things better. So reason is about how to do that. Anything that you don't like, that you don't understand and want to understand, anything that's unsatisfactory in some way, that is the kind of thing reason can help with. It's very broad and just good. There's nothing bad about reason. There's nothing objectionable about reason. It's just something everyone should like and be interested in. One of the big ideas of reason is rejecting authority. 
you don't seek the truth by obeying people. You don't seek the truth by finding out who has the best credentials, or who has a crown on his head, or who says that God spoke to him, or who has the fanciest diploma on their wall. The only way to seek the truth is you look at the actual ideas. Does this idea solve this problem? Why not? What are the reasons? Do you have criticisms of it? Do you have criticisms of it? You have to look at the content of the ideas, not the sources. It doesn't matter who thought of an idea. It matters, is it true or not? Do you have criticisms of it? Do you see anything wrong with it? You know, how does it stand up to debate? Instead of so-and-so says so, or so-and-so's opinion is this, you want to look at what are the actual qualities of the idea. What problem is it trying to solve? How does it solve it? Does that make sense? You have to look at the actual issues, not um, how famous is the person who says it's good or bad. A lot of people with views kind of along these lines are somewhat anti-traditional. They want to sweep away all the bad ideas and sort of reforge the world into a new and better world, a brave new world, where everyone is more rational and has much better ideas. Out with the old, in with ideas that finally make sense. They see a lot of things wrong with the world. They see ways people are dumb. They see lots of mistakes people are making. And, you know, sometimes they're mistaken and they're observing incorrectly and they don't know what's going on, but a lot of times they're right. There, there are a lot of problems with the world, and smart people can look around and see a lot of the problems and be right about lots of them. But that doesn't mean you should just get rid of everything and start over. Um, that's a really bad idea and it's dangerous. If you get rid of everything and you start over, what will happen is people will make new mistakes. You're not going to get everything right this time. You're going to screw up in new ways. You're going to make this whole complex system a whole like new society, a new way of thinking, a new everything. And there are going to be so many new mistakes in it. These people focus too much on the mistakes that they're aware of. You know, they see the problems with the current world, but they're not seeing the problems with their hypothetical imagined world. They don't know what's wrong with it. They don't know what all the errors are there. And they so they imagine utopia. Um, because, But once they actually lived in it, they would find out all kinds of... It has its own problems, and then they would be unhappy with those. So my approach is to have some respect for tradition. It's not sacred. You can improve it, you can criticize it, you can make changes but you want to be a bit careful about it. And the, the basic goal is step-by-step -step reform. You know, find something that you can improve and improve it and do that over and over and over again and things can get a lot better. If you want to have big changes, you should do it in a lot of little steps. Little steps have a lot of advantages. They're easier to understand. They're easier to judge if it's actually an improvement or not. They're easier to revert. They're, it's easier to say, oh no, this was a bad idea. Let's undo that. When you change a lot of things at once, Usually what happens is some things get better and some get worse, and it's very hard to tell like which changes cause the good things and which changes cause the bad things. You get a lot of debates about that. Like the government will pass like 500 new laws this year, and then some things get better and some things get worse, and it's very hard to start, sort out like which laws were good and which ones are bad, and people just argue endlessly about it. But if you do things more like one at a time, uh, you can have an easier time figuring out what the effects of each of the things you're doing is. It's hard with the government because they're dealing with so much stuff at once, like the whole society. It's hard for them to do one, at a, one thing at a time because they have so many urgent problems to deal with. But for an individual in your life, like maybe you're a scientist and you have your career, you're working on one or a couple things at a time. You can make like a limited number of changes and see what happens. You're not as overwhelmed as the whole government. With the government, what they should do is... Try to change like one thing at a time, like for each topic, so that it's less confusing. Well, you can do that too. You can change one thing in your romantic relationships right now, and another thing in your career, and another thing in like how you read books. But if you try to change like 50 things about how you read books all at once, then it's going to be hard to tell what is progress and what isn't progress. 
Anyway, the tradition thing relates to evolution. The way evolution works is it's replication with a little bit of variation. Like the new things are mostly the same and a little bit new. You know, think of it as roughly 99.99% the same and 0.001% new stuff that's different. And that's how evolution works. If you change like half the stuff every time, there'd be too little stability and um, animals would not be able to evolve. They're only able to evolve because of um, small occasional changes rather than just constant flux and chaos. And then on the other hand, you don't want total stability. If nothing ever changed, if the change rate was 0.000001%, you, know, you wouldn't get anywhere. So the right way to look at change is you want like 1% change or 0.1% change, kind of around there. It's not half and half. It's mostly things stay the same and you change a little bit. But you have to change more than nothing. You know, it's important to have change, but not too much all at once. You can take that as like common sense advice. Um, as just sort of a reasonable way to look at it. But it's also like literally and exactly correct because of the tie into evolution, which is not an analogy. We actually learn by evolution. And so those are the actual constraints on how learning works and how we can make progress. And the progress we make doesn't have boundaries. It's not like we can only get so good and then we're stuck. We don't hit the end of the road. Humanity has, if it wants it, an infinite journey ahead of us. We can learn without limit. We can just make more and more progress, make things better and better, get better technology, colonize the universe. The sky's the limit. Because there's nothing to stop us, fundamentally. Our brains are capable of learning new things and dealing with reality. We're constrained by the laws of physics, like we can't travel faster than light, as far as we know. And that, if that's a hard limit and there, we never find a way around it, that's okay. That doesn't, that doesn't ruin progress. You know, we can live with that. And as far as we know, you know, there's nothing in the laws of physics that makes it a terrible universe we can't deal with. You know, there's nothing awful there. There's nothing to limit our improvement of civilization. Um, there's nothing to ever stop us from having better ideas or becoming more moral. To some extent, these ideas will sound somewhat reasonable and familiar to a lot of people, but there are some major differences from other perspectives on science. Most people are inductivists. They think that we learn by induction, which means roughly taking data sets and generalizing patterns from them and believing that patterns are likely to continue into the future and that we can therefore make predictions about the future, which are not guaranteed, but are uh, probabilistically likely. There's, there's a lot of variations on induction. You know, some of them are infallibilists and, you know, throw out the probability part, but that's the, the gist of it. So their focus is on data first instead of uh, purpose first. And then it tries to derive answers from data instead of from critical thinking. And it focuses on mathematical patterns instead of explanations of ideas and reasoning. And it doesn't have much room for criticism. A lot of inductivists tack on criticism later, but that shows their inconsistency because if your epistemology is based on induction, you should be thorough about that. You know, if we learn by observing patterns and data, where does the criticism come in? You're just adding that in separately because it's a good idea, not because it's part of inductivist philosophy. And so you run into problems like, well, do you have multiple epistemologies, like induction and some other one that has criticism in it? Another major idea is that evidence supports ideas. And not only supports them, but supports them by particular amounts. You know, this one is strong evidence for this, and this other piece of data is weak evidence for it. 
and it adds up to uh, slightly extra strong evidence or a slightly extra good idea or something. So they try to score ideas. They don't always use numbers. Sometimes it's words like good or great. But they're trying to evaluate ideas by sort of adding points or score to them based on how much evidence they have for the idea. And then the one with the highest score wins. And that is fundamentally anti-critical because the, the idea with the highest score could have a criticism of it that they're just ignoring. And they say, okay, well, I subtracted 20 points because you had a criticism. And they ignore that the criticism is an explanation of why the idea cannot work, why it's wrong, why it's false. They're not thinking in terms of decisive criticisms and like clear arguments. They're just fudging everything into, I don't really know how to evaluate that, so I'll add 10 points or subtract 10 points or whatever. And they don't say it that plainly, so it can be hard to detect, but that is what the attitude amounts to. Moving on to a pretty different topic. Uh, memes are... Memes are not just jokes, and they're not just uh, sort of a new fad. And they're not just like an analogy to genes. Ideas literally replicate themselves, just like genes replicate themselves. They cause their replication. An idea gets from one person to another, and now there's a copy of it. It exists in two places. And there is logic to how replicators work. There are things known about this, and they're important, and they lead to... They can be studied, we can figure things out. In his book, The Beginning of Infinity, David Deutsch presents some particularly important ideas about memes. He divides them into two categories based on their replication strategy. In other words, what about an idea causes it to replicate? How does it get people to share it with other people? And especially share it with younger people. Because for a meme to last long term, it has to be transferred from older people to younger people. And it has to keep doing that, or eventually it would die out. Because if you transfer it to older people, they're going to die before you. You need people that are going to die after you, on average, to get a meme from you, or the meme's not going to last. So there are two replication strategies for how a meme gets transferred to a new person. The first one is a rational meme. It gets transferred because it's a good idea. It's useful. It's helpful. It solves a problem. It accomplishes some purpose people want to accomplish. So people share it because it's a good idea. The second type of meme is an irrational meme. It is transferred to people because people are unable to criticize it. It blocks their creativity. It blocks their cr critical faculties. Something about the meme makes them have a hard time rejecting it or not transferring it to other people. So it's sort of a mind control type of meme. A common way this manifests is people feel bad if they question or doubt it. You see that a lot with religions, where it is painful for people to consider other alternative ideas. They find it hard to move away from the idea. You know, they're not sticking with it because it's a good idea. There's elements of that, but there's also something that blocks them from changing, from thinking critically, from rejecting it. So there are a lot of irrational memes in the world. This shouldn't be super surprising if you already believe there's a lot of irrationality in the world. So the reason people are irrational is they have irrational ideas. They have, you know, they're not just doing it randomly, they're acting on bad ideas. And by and large, they did not create these bad ideas themselves. They've been passed down from generation to generation. Many of the bad ideas are very old. And they're highly adapted. They've had many, many generations to get fine-tuned, so it's hard for people to criticize them, reject them, um, look at them in an unbiased, neutral way. 
So I wanted to talk a bit about what I view as some of the most broken parts of society. And I think this is caused by irrational memes as the underlying mechanism. I don't want to just blame memes, though. People make their own choices. They're responsible for their behavior. My general view is mind controlling a person is very, very hard. And what memes are really good at doing is controlling a person when they abdicate responsibility. If a person doesn't control themselves, if they leave like a void, a vacuum, if they're passive, if they don't make their own choices, then memes can fill that void and control them. You know, when the person isn't controlling himself, then the meme can control him. But if people choose to control their own lives and run their own lives, then they can do that. So it's up to them. If you want to be a responsible person and think everything through and reason out your choices, you can do that. If you don't do those things, then... And you just sort of try to trust common sense and go with the flow and do what you vaguely think society says you're supposed to do. If you act that way, and you're just sort of passive and obedient, then your life will be run by static memes, irrational memes. So the most important irrational memes deal with parenting. Because parents and the behavior of parents and how they treat their children is the number one biggest factor in which ideas get passed on to the next generation. Remember, the most important for, thing for memes is the transfer of ideas from older people to younger people. And parenting is the, the biggest factor in that. So the, the fiercest competition for the memes uh, to evolve and be best adapted to succeed and get replicated instead of others. There's only a limited amount of transfer of ideas to the next generation, so only the very best memes can survive and keep getting replicated. And the memes that are less effective die out. So you get the strongest, most powerful memes where you have the fiercest competition, um, which is parenting. So I think parenting is the number one most irrational area of life. It's what people are the very worst at. And it's an area where there are a lot of exceptions that are made. You know, you can't hit people in general, but you can hit your children. Yelling at coworkers is considered really quite rude and bad and so on, but yelling at your children is normal. If your spouse does something you don't like, it's pretty unusual to take his Xbox away or take his cell phone away and say he just can't have it for a few months or a few weeks or something. But that's done to children all the time. Children are given timeouts, spankings, and just they don't have much control over their life and they're not given all the rights and freedoms that everyone else is. They get a lot of special treatment, and that treatment is, in general, uh, worse, negative. People want to grow up and stop being a child. They don't like it. They feel mistreated. They have a bad time. They cry a lot, and people treat their crying as not a big deal and just part of childhood. My view is that Punishing children is not educational. They don't learn their lesson when you hurt them. Hurting doesn't explain what a better idea is. It doesn't explain what's wrong with their idea or what they did. Even if you're right, punishing is not how you teach someone. If you want them to understand things, you need to encourage their curiosity, answer their questions, um, give good advice, be a trusted advisor who they actually want to come to. You know, why do kids lie to their parents so much? because their parents are not on their side, and they know it. They know that if their parent knew the truth, things would happen that they don't want. So they try to hide information from their parents so that they can have a little bit of control over their lives. So in that kind of situation, it's very hard to help your kids and share good ideas. And what ends up happening, in short, is parents hurt their children in such a way that they destroy their minds and make them irrational and transfer irrational memes into them so that they do it again to the next generation. And this is a perpetual cycle where all the parents hurt their children 
and then those children grow up to do the same thing, and so on. Another exception with parents is they're especially authoritarian. In most areas of life, they don't act like a dictator. But when it comes to their children, they say things like, because I said so. They want to just boss, pe boss their kids around instead of having to deal with reasoning and negotiation and discussion. So the next offender is basically teachers who act quite a lot like parents and play a significant role in parenting. Kids have to be forced to go to school. They don't like it. They don't find that it is helpful to them from their perspective. They don't find that it serves their goals, serves their interests. They broadly just don't find it useful or fun. They find it boring and pointless. That is not because math is boring. It's not because history is boring. You know, the subjects at school are actually useful. Being able to write is useful. Being able to read is useful. Understanding things about the world and about history is useful. Not everyone should learn every subject. There's room for variation. Not everyone's interested in everything, but... You know, chemistry, physics, dinosaurs, whatever, art, those things are topics that should interest a lot of people. There's a lot of good things about those topics. So how do schools make them so terrible? Teachers give lectures and expect students to obey them. Teachers do not see their role as helpers. It's not like the student is living his own life and trying to learn things and trying to make progress, and then sometimes he runs into a problem or has a question and the teacher helps him out and he keeps going. You know, the basic format of school is not on the student's own initiative. It's not his learning project. The teacher has a curriculum, an agenda that she's imposing on the student. The teacher already knows before the class starts what the right answers are. There's no room for criticism. There's no room for debate. There's no room for different opinions. There's an answer key. Write the answers the teacher wants on the test or get a bad grade. So it's completely different than rational thinking and discussing and learning. It's anti-fallibilist. It's authoritarian. The teacher thinks they know the truth and students should just shut up and listen. And they interpret, in general, dissent as disobedience. Instead of being able to deal with dissent with arguments and reasoning, and, you know, a lot of times, the kid's wrong. You know, if the kid's doubting the thing in the textbook, sometimes the textbook's wrong, but the majority of the time, the kid is wrong. But how you deal with someone who's wrong makes a big difference. You know, are you mean to him? Are you condescending? Do you just tell him to learn it your way? Or do you actually debate it like it's an open question and something to think about and you're fallible too and where you're trying to seek the truth which way you do it makes a big difference to someone's experience having a right answer forced on you that you think is wrong is psychologically the same experience as having a wrong answer forced on you that you know is wrong you know if an if an idea is being forced on you and you think it's wrong it's the same thing whether it's true or not because from your perspective psychologically you think it's wrong and they're just making you accept this idea, whether you like it or not, and they won't give reasons, they won't explain it to your satisfaction, they won't address all of your objections. And then they wonder why people don't learn things very well. It's because they didn't get all their objections addressed, they just copied down what the teacher said and regurgitated it. Why do schools have tests? You know, tests are not a good learning tool. It's not like tests are there so that you can check your understanding so you can learn it better. If that was the actual purpose, and they were designed for that, and they were good at it, tests would be voluntary. You know, people would say, oh, I think I learned a lot. I want to take a test now and check. The purpose of tests is to find out if kids are obeying. Did, did he listen? Did he read the reading he was supposed to read? Does he remember the things I want him to remember? Tests are part of the enforcement mechanism because kids are always not doing what the teacher says. It's hard to make the kids obey everything. So the authority um, has ways of checking whether kids are conforming or not. So there, there's constant like vigilance and monitoring to stamp out resistance, rebellion, revolt. So it, it's a really bad situation. 
And the fundamental problems are that it's not critical and it's not the kid trying to learn things to solve his own problems, it's him being told what to do and what to think. And not even being able to ask many questions or give many objections and doubts. In real learning, you should be able to say, like, I disagree with this, here's why. And you can do that a lot, even if you're wrong a lot, and you learn more that way because you find out why you're wrong. You know, you, you have to share your ideas, even if they're wrong, and get real answers to them. And parents and teachers are really bad at that. Another area of society I have a lot of issues with is romantic relationships and monogamous marriages and love and dating. And also a lot of social status stuff that is partly related to those things, but it's partly separate. You know, you can have uh, social status at work, in career, in uh, trying to be famous, trying to have a lot of Twitter followers. There's, there's a lot of social status stuff where people compete not for having good ideas or being productive, not for creating a lot of wealth or um, knowledge, but for who can win a popularity contest and put down other people and appear better than them. And one of the common social dynamics rules is the law of least effort. Whoever appears to put less effort in is higher status. Whoever's chasing the other person and trying harder is considered low status. And that's really awful and irrational because it it punishes people who care about things and are and are energetic and curious and interested and actually want to put effort in. You know, the sort of default assumption of how people judge social status is everyone is lazy and doesn't want to do anything and whoever succeeds the most at that is clearly the best person the the one with the most money and subordinates and so on anyway romance has those dynamics and quite a bit more it has ideas like soulmates which is magical thinking and unrealistic it has promising to be together forever. How do you know you won't change your minds? How do you prevent changing your minds? People don't take these things seriously. Like, what stops you from drifting apart? Is it ever good to drift apart? Sometimes people think about these things, but then they also just go and promise, you know, we're in love, it'll last forever, etc. And it's hard to talk openly about these things. It's discouraged to share your doubts with your romantic partner. Rules for jealousy and exclusivity do not seem designed for practicality today. You can see how they were more practical in the past before we had birth control. Um, people wanted to know that like this was their kid. I think if someone wants to sleep with someone else and then they're prevented from it by just massive societal pressure... That's not a good situation. But that happens all the time. People all the time are tempted to cheat. You know, they see some upside in it. They see appeal in it. And then they don't do it because it would destroy their family. You know, there's a major downside. So they're, it's sort of like they're not doing it because of a threat. And that is not rational persuasion. That's not understanding why it is best to be exclusive. And I don't think it's always best to be exclusive. People act like monogamy is for absolutely everyone, and it's just the way relationships work, and they take it for granted. And I think it's one option, and there are some good things about it and some bad things about it, and it shouldn't be treated as the automatic option for everyone. A lot of people clearly don't really want monogamy, so they do serial monogamy. They have a bunch of short-term relationships so that they can date a bunch of different people and hook up with a bunch of different people. And, like, is it really making the world better if it's if there's no overlap between any of those people ever? Like, the reason they're doing that is because monogamy is just so ingrained in the world that they feel that they have to instead of being able to think rationally about it. I also think that sex and love and strong feelings are overrated. They're not... They're not as good or useful or important as people act like. People exaggerate how fun sex is, similar to how they exaggerate how fun beer is and how wonderful coffee is. There are these 
symbols in our culture that you're supposed to really, really like. And so people say they do. And there's not a lot of room for people to make their own choices. I don't think most people should have weird lifestyles. They'll probably fuck it up. They don't really know what they're doing. You know, they're not wiser than common sense. But I think that it's a lot more oppressive and pressuring than it has to be. People will know each other for like two years and then they're making a lifelong commitment when they're in their 20s. They don't know what they want when they're 40. They don't know what will make their life better then. They don't know what kind of person they should be with. And they, they choose a lot based on sex appeal who they're going to be a co-parent with. Like, does that make sense? Does finding someone sexy mean they're going to be a good mother? It's well known that people get foolish when they have romantic relationships, and also that a lot of romantic relationships fail, and then people get hurt. And I think those are bad things. I think something that causes people to be foolish and biased and not thinking clearly is dangerous, and people are not respectful of quite how dangerous it is. And something that routinely ends up hurting people in big ways I also think that's dangerous and people are not respectful of how big a problem there is there. The large majority of relationships end in breakups. Of marriages, quite a few end up in divorce. And then of the ones that don't end up in divorce, a lot of them are unhappy marriages where they're staying together because of the kids or social pressure or um, just not changing things, like not wanting to blow up their life and have a big event. So there's some really broken things there. There's some things wrong there. And this is not random. Courtship behavior determines who is a parent with who in what circumstances. Romance is the thing that leads up to parenting. And so it is fairly closely connected to parenting memes. It is an area where irrational memes uh, would compete over a lot because it has uh, influence on what ideas get transferred to the next generation. So that's a bit about some of the problems with the world. Moving on, I'm going to talk about some of my ideas. So, so far I've talked about ideas that I agree with, but I did not invent them. I studied a bunch of thinkers and read a bunch of different perspectives and thought about it myself and talked with people and tried to organize the ideas and understand them better. And the things I've been telling you are not original to me. They're, it's my version of it. I've said it in my own words, but, you know, I've only made like relatively minor changes to what other people thought of before me. So now I'm going to talk about some of my own ideas where it is primarily something original to me, some sort of significant new idea. So this is some of my work in philosophy, trying to contribute uh, progress. So the first idea is paths forward. This is about how to have discussions and organize learning so that there is always a path forward, which means a way that your mistakes can get corrected. And the focus is on, suppose that I make a mistake, um, and for simplicity, make it about something important and part of my public career. Um, this applies the best to public intellectuals, so like people who write blog posts and write books, authors, scientists, stuff like that. So they're, they're doing their career, and they make a mistake, and someone else on the planet knows it's a mistake. He knows a better idea. He knows the truth. Is it possible for the correction to get from this person who knows the better idea to the guy who just made the mistake? Is there a way for him to be told about his error and for it to be fixed? And if there is a way, is it reasonable? Is it realistic? You know, is it really, really hard or is it uh, more actually going to happen? How difficult are you making it for people to correct you? And 
So I have ideas about how to do that and why it's important and that uh, people are currently really quite bad at it. And a lot of what people do is they say, oh, I'm really busy, so I only listen to prestigious people and they just won't really take feedback from the vast majority of people on the planet. And I think that's really sad because it prevents error correction. And, you know, we never have all the perfect answers. So it's understandable that you're not going to know everything. But if someone does know something, it's really sad if you don't get this knowledge that already exists, if you block it off from getting to you. So you stay wrong even when someone knew the right answer and was willing to share it with you. If you still stay wrong, something's screwed up. So you need methods for dealing with uh, feedback, criticism, comments, etc., which don't take too much time and don't block off a bunch of good ideas. And so I have a methodology for how to organize your intellectual work and your discussions and so on in order to do that well. And some of the main ideas are not ignoring criticism. Um, and that might sound time consuming. So the basic thing you do is you need to reuse things. If you get a bunch of, like, say you have too many different criticisms, comments, arguments coming in. You need to find that a bunch of them are the same, and you just you write one answer, you write like an essay, and then for each person who says the same thing, you just link them to the essay instead of writing it again. So that saves a huge amount of time. And you don't even have to use your own essay. If someone already wrote that essay, someone else wrote it, then you just link to their essay. And you say, here, this is what I think, this answers your question. And so you can give very short answers when you reuse material that already exists. And then if someone points out a criticism with that essay, you know, now there's something new to say, and it's worth improving the essay. And if this is done over and over and over again, the essay gets really good. It has all these criticisms. Um, it has all these fixes to it and uh, points of clarification and footnotes that answer potential criticisms in advance and so on and so forth. And it gets like really solid and robust. And if you do this with lots of stuff, you end up um, building up knowledge, making progress. You get better information in the world. And whenever someone has a criticism, it's important to remember that. So first of all, you could be wrong. And second of all, if they're wrong, it's good if they can learn something. You want to shut them down in a way where they can correct their mistake, which means sending them off to an explanation instead of just saying you're wrong or ignoring them. If you can give them a link so that they can learn something and you do that all the time, then your critics will be able to improve and you'll get better feedback in the future because people know more. And if you're famous and popular enough that this is like still too much work, even though you're reusing ideas all the time and just giving a bunch of links, there are two big things to do. One is, um, where are all these ideas coming from? Um, if you can find like patterns, if you, if you can find broader patterns and more general principles to address, then you can make essays that cover more ground at once. And so that simplifies your job. You know, instead of having like 500 different answers to 500 questions, you can realize, oh, these 10 questions actually all relate to the same error, and we can cover all that with one essay. You know, you, you can organize your knowledge better, and that's a way to improve it and streamline things. And the other thing is if you're so famous that you're getting like, you know, you have millions of fans, then you ought to be able to have uh, fans who help you and answer the easy questions for you. You know, you can have proxies who talk for you and, uh, you know, point people to your FAQ or whatever. And you can hire people to help you too. If you have that many fans, you ought to be able to afford some help. And, but for the vast majority of intellectuals, they're not that popular. They're not flooded with inquiries. Um, so it's a lot simpler. But they nevertheless do not have paths forward. And th there's various other things you can do. Like even if you're not answering every criticism, you can answer a random selection of criticism so that it's not biased. You can answer some, some issues that were proposed by, that were chosen by your opponents instead of the ones you want to answer. You know, you can let some of your critics choose a couple of the points that you're going to answer to try to prevent bias. You can periodically, publicly, answer what you think were the two best criticisms you got this month. 
Like, I think a lot of intellectuals already spend enough time. It's just answering critics, engaging with people, thinking about things. It's just not organized well. And so for almost everyone, they feel completely like shut off, blocked off. There's just no possible way to make progress on pointing out any mistake the intellectual is making. Even if they're right, there's just no way that he's ever going to listen, as the general impression most people have with most intellectuals. And that's really broken. And so I have a bunch of essays about that. I think it's important and that there's a lot of room for progress there. All right, next topic. Powering up and doing easy slash efficient things. So activities you do um, have a cost. If you write an essay, it takes a certain amount of work. If you build something, it has a certain amount of effort involved. And the more you learn, the more cheaply you can do things. Like you become a better writer and then you can write an essay more cheaply. It takes less effort. So the basic pattern of life should be uh, the more you can push the learning and the getting better at things earlier in time, the more stuff you're going to get done because when you're doing it, you're better at it. This is why we have our education uh, when we're in childhood instead of in our 70s. You know, first you learn a bunch of stuff and then you use it. Um, it wouldn't make sense to first do a bunch of stuff and then learn a bunch of stuff later, you know? So the ordering is very important. And to some extent, this is common sense, but I think it's not uh, taken seriously enough and uh, looked at in a thorough enough way. So... My basic idea is that anytime you're doing something that's hard, that's inefficient. That means it is expensive. That means you're not very good at it. And you're spending a lot of resources, time and possibly time, focus, attention, creativity, possibly money, materials, etc., doing it. And anytime you're doing hard things, that is taking effort away from learning. It's taking effort away from powering up, from getting better at things. And so if, if you want to do something, the most efficient thing to do is learn a lot until it's actually really easy and then do it when it's cheap and it doesn't take up much resources. So being really cost efficient. So I think the pattern people get into is they want to do things now. They don't want to wait. And so they put learning off till later and they do some stuff and Often it goes wrong because the the more marginal things are, the more you're on the borderline of just barely being able to do it, the more likely it is to fail or have setbacks. Whereas the risk, the better you get at things, the more the risk goes down. If you're doing something that's like way below your skill level, so it's really easy, um, you're probably not going to fuck it up. But if you're doing something that you're, it's just barely at your skill level, there's like a good chance you'll screw it up. So people... Anyways, people are trying to do things like now they're they're in a hurry um, and they, they put off learning toward, till later and then they never get to it because their projects uh, keep taking longer than they expect and being harder than they expect and things go wrong and errors happen. And, and so they're so busy because of their failed projects that now like they really don't have time for learning and they're rushing off to the next project and... So they, you can get into a really bad pattern. But if you go the other way, um, if you really focus on practicing, learning, getting better at things, instead of um, instead of doing some particular goals right away, then when you do do the goals, they're a lot cheaper, and you have all this free time, and you can learn a lot more and do even better and more advanced goals and those are also cheap, and then you can, it's like, it can be a really virtuous cycle, and you can have basically exponential gains against someone who's doing it the other way. And a good way to think about this is in terms of investment and consumption. So you have a budget of resources, and you can invest them in yourself, in your future, in, in having a larger budget in the future, because you're getting interest, or you can spend it. And the earlier you spend and the more you spend, you get a lot less money in the future than if you invest early on. 
And so this also relates to overreaching, which is one of the main mistakes I think people make in life. The idea here is overreaching is doing things where your rate of making errors is overwhelming your ability to correct errors. People are only so good at dealing with errors, at finding out what they're doing wrong, at correcting it, at improving it, at recovering from errors, and so on. So if you do things that are too difficult, then lots of problems come up and it overwhelms your problem solving ability. And you have a really bad time, you got stuck, you got stressed out, um, you maybe give up. And if you do something that's not too hard for you, then there's going to be some problems, some things go wrong, but it's manageable. You know, it's not scaring you. It's within what you know how to cope with and deal with. And then it goes fairly smoothly. So I think people get really behind on learning. They don't learn enough. And then they do projects that are way too hard for them. And then they're not that great at problem solving and dealing with errors and problems and mistakes and things going wrong. And then they have a lot of those, you know, tons of it. Because they're doing things that are beyond their skill level. And so they, they can't deal with all those errors. And then what happens is they give up on truth. They give up on error correction. They're not able to make everything work right. So they just start fudging things and taking shortcuts. And that you get into a really bad state that way. And you also get a lot of short-term thinking because their long-term plans just chronically don't work out how they planned it. And so they reach for a lot of short-term benefits that sacrifice the long-term. Yes or no philosophy is about evaluating arguments, ideas, criticisms in a yes or no way, a binary way, rather than on a continuum uh, with a score or with uh, good, better, best, um, only two outcomes, yes or no. So it's a very decisive approach. And I think that it makes epistemology a lot more elegant and cleaned up and correct. I think it solves a bunch of the problems Popper ran into when he was uh, reimagining epistemology. He, he made major revolutionary changes by reject rejecting induction and developing an, an evolutionary epistemology and uh, talking about things like criticism. And I think that if you take his work and then you add on top of it this binary evaluation of ideas and criticisms, uh, it fixes up the issues it had and makes it work better. So the basic thing I object to is the concept of a strong argument or the strength of an argument or the weight of an argument. Also evidence works the same way. So I think that the right way to look at criticisms is they're either decisive or they're nothing. So a criticism should say why this idea fails to solve this problem, why it doesn't work. And you need to evaluate either the criticism correctly refutes the idea so we can reject it or it doesn't. It's one way or the other. And I think all the, the fudging, the hedging, the equivocating just makes things worse and ambiguous. For each of these things, I have essays and other materials with a lot of details. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've got a lot of material with more explanation. So this is only an overview. Um, if you have doubts and questions and so on, you're welcome to ask them or go search for more information on my websites. Um, I'll link you to them later. So, ideas do not half solve problems. Either it works or it doesn't work. Either it meets the criteria of a solution or it doesn't. And there, there's a lot of confusion about this because of vague problems and vague evaluations. So, people think there's like a half solution because it like sort of partly works, but that's because the problem didn't clearly define um, what constitutes success. Like, the, people will think the problem is make a bunch of money, and then they'll think if you make, like, 20 grand, that's, like, a really good solution. If you make, like, 10 grand, that's, like, half a solution. But the problem is the problem is vague. It didn't say how much money constituted success. 
if you make your problems more clear and you say the problem is make 15 grand or more, then you can evaluate which ideas solve the problems better. And you can consider which is the problem I want to solve. Make 10 grand or more, make 15 grand or more, make 20 grand or more, like what is the actual goal? So clarity about those things improves uh, thinking, discussion, etc. So when an idea seems to half solve a problem, what it's really doing is solving a different problem with lower standards, like making a smaller amount of money. So that's one of the ideas that helps enable more clear-cut, black and white uh, evaluations of ideas. It also helps with the paths forward stuff, because if everything is muddy and gray, and you can never really agree or disagree with anything, or rule anything out or reject anything, then there's no real way to answer critics, because the criticism just mounts up and you half refute everything, and it's all a matter of arbitrary opinion and whatever. You kind of get a mess. But if you can actually categorize ideas as either refuted or non-refuted, and the non-refuted ones need to be addressed, and you can actually organize ideas in a good way, then you can make progress better, and you don't have to just start uh, deciding what to ignore. You can actually deal with the issues. All right, moving on now to economics and politics. I'm a liberal, and liberalism means freedom from violence. Interact voluntarily for mutual benefit or leave each other alone. That means peace and free trade. This lets everyone live by their own ideas instead of being enslaved. So this is not what liberalism means today in America because people use the word wrong. But liberalism is supposed to have to do with liberty, and it is a long tradition of thought that is associated with free trade and freedom. Um, and small government, basically. And... Um, rebellion against authority, or limiting authority at least. Having the government not just be like um, limiting the king's authority and saying that citizens have rights and the king doesn't just have arbitrary control over everything. You know, putting uh, checks and balances into the government, putting restrictions in place, limits on power. That kind of thing is liberal. And today, the so called liberals on the left are in favor of big government, more powerful government more paternalistic authority controlling your life and more controls on trade, more regulations instead of leaving people to be free. So I view that as more and more slavery. Instead of letting everyone live by their own idea and be left to their own devices, they're being told what to do. They're having less control over their life they have masters in the government who are making some of their decisions for them. So there's a lot of confusion about the word freedom. The important thing is freedom means not having violence used against you. It means you can live your life and be left alone. It's not a positive right to things like health care. Not having health care doesn't mean you aren't free. Free means that you can do your best with your own resources to uh, improve your life and live according to your own ideas, your own values, your own judgments of what is a good life. Freedom means you can pursue your self-interest and you can make your own choices. And you can think for yourself and you can have unconventional ideas, you can be an outlier, and no one's going to stop you. No one is going to use violence to prevent you from living your life. That doesn't mean they're going to give you stuff. It doesn't mean they're going to help you. They're just not going to punch you or shoot you or take your property away from you. Violence is bad, and not just because it hurts people. You know, suffering is bad, but also violence is irrational. Violence is not truth-seeking. When you punch someone to get your way, it doesn't matter who was right. If you were right and you punch him, you get your way. If he was right and you punch him, you get your way. Might makes right is not truth makes right. It's not looking for the truth. It's not critical thinking. It's not trying to figure out what's best. Property is part of living your life and having control over it. 
Just controlling your physical body is not enough to have a reasonable life. You need to be able to have shelter, have clothes, have tools, um, interact with nature, and do things like make a fishing pole, or make a trap to catch an animal, or more advanced things in the modern world, have computers, iPhones, etc. Being able to have those things is part of how you use your mind and your ideas and deal with reality. You deal with reality partly by controlling your muscles and your body, moving your hand in a certain way, uh, turning your head in a certain way, looking at something, gathering information, observing. Uh, but also, you know, you deal with pieces of reality, objects, and you need to be able to have some control over those objects in a long-term way. Like building a house. So property is being able to maintain some of your changes to reality, some of your ways of dealing with reality over time. And you just can't have a reasonable life without property, without, um, without some stability of what physical resources are available to you. Being able to know, like, this is mine, and if someone disagrees with me, it's still mine and I can do whatever I want, and he can just do his own thing separately. There has to be some way that you can acquire resources, and then your decision controls the resource so that you can make plans about the future that don't get disrupted. So when people disagree, there's basically three things they can do. They can talk about it and try to agree. They can leave each other alone and go their separate ways. Or they can fight. They can try to hurt each other. They can try to control or enslave each other or kill each other, you know? So liberalism is very, very in favor of peace and nonviolence. You know, if you want to voluntarily try to interact, discuss, persuade each other, come to agree about something, great. Um, if you find it easy and you're able to trade ideas or property or whatever, great. And if it's not working, um, do not resort to violence. Just go your separate ways. Violence doesn't improve things. Defense is okay because when you're defending yourself, the outcome was going to be violent either way. If you don't defend yourself and you just let him shoot you, it was decided by violence. And if you do defend yourself, it was decided by violence. By defending yourself, you're not making things worse. You're not um, deviating from truth-seeking. You're not changing something that would have been determined by the truth into something that's not going to be determined by the truth. And when I say the truth there, I mean your best judgment of the truth, because we don't, we're not omniscient, like we don't know the ultimate, final, perfect truth, but we have our best understanding of it, and we want that to inform um, the outcomes of things. So I'm in favor of capitalism, which means free trade. It means if I want to have your thing and you want to have my thing and we can agree on it voluntarily, if we think it's in our mutual best interest, if I think it's in my interest and you think it's in your interest, then we can swap. And we don't we can we can swap not just goods, but also um, goods that are called money, you know, gold coins or paper dollars or whatever. And we can also swap services. Um, including labor. I can work for you or vice versa. Uh, and that can be a one-time thing or it can be ongoing, you know, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. And that's no one's business but ours. But only the people involved in the interaction should really have a say in it. And if they both like it, then it's just between them. And it's not other people's place to butt in and say, well, you both think that that would improve both of your lives, but we're not going to let you do it. That's an attack on freedom. And there's, there's a lot of economics for why capitalism works and helps people and so on. And if you're interested in that, I've got some authors I can recommend, but I'm not going to do a economics lecture right now. One author that's particularly good is George... Reisman. If you go to his website, capitalism.net, 
you can find his treatise on economics on the sidebar on the left. The book is called Capitalism, a treatise on economics, and it is really, really good. And he also has a couple dozen short ebooks on Kindle that you can find. And he will be linked in the video description. All right, so another important idea of liberalism is the harmony of interests doctrine. The idea is that there are no conflicts of interest between people, fundamentally. Fighting each other is never in anyone's interest. There's always a solution that's best for everyone. There's a win-win solution. There is a truth of the matter that everyone should prefer to any other alternatives. There don't have to be winners and losers. We can all be winners. Now, that includes leaving each other alone. It's not saying that we always have to interact. It's, it's completely fine and legitimate that sometimes we just go our separate ways. And no one loses. That's fine. It's not really much of a win, but, you know, it's better than violence, and there's nothing wrong with it. But the point is, no one has to lose. So, like, neutral outcomes are okay, but, but people actually losing, being hurt, being sacrificed, being screwed over, that's not okay. That shouldn't happen. It doesn't have to happen. When that happens, it's a mistake. Something, someone's made a mistake, and better ideas could solve the problem. So, people think there are a lot of conflicts um, like, it's in my interest to get this job, and it's in your interest to get the job. We're both applying for the same job. So they think that's a conflict. But it is actually in both of our interests that employers be free to hire the best person. If you didn't have that situation as the general context, then there wouldn't be a job available anyways. I'm not losing if I don't get a job that I wasn't the best candidate for. I can go find a different job. If I think that my interest is to get a job that I don't deserve, if I want the unearned, I am trying to fight with reality and reason. And that's actually not going to make my life better. I think a helpful way to look at this is there are no conflicts of interest where violence is the answer. So, they never justify violence. It's never a situation where someone's going to be screwed in such a significant way that they're actually better off going to war over it than losing out. So you can see that easily with the job situation. You know, I might not be thrilled that I didn't get the job, but it's not, it doesn't merit violence. I'm better off applying for another job than trying to shoot you and take the job. And why is it that I can go peacefully do something else and that's okay? Because there are other good things in life. There are other ways for me to get ahead and get things I want. You know, I haven't been blocked and screwed over. I'm not stuck. I'm not being thwarted from having a good life. Um, I may not have made progress on this particular path, but there are hundreds of other paths that are not blocked for me to make progress. My favorite essay on this is called The Conflicts of Men's Interests, I think. It's uh, chapter four of The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. All right, what about government? What's the proper role of government? It is to protect men from violence. The thing we want a government for is to protect our freedom, defend our property, prevent violence. Um, have a peaceful society, and deal with criminals. When the government does other things, like hand out food, or um, certify who is allowed to be a doctor, it is stepping outside the boundaries of its purpose, and that's bad. Why is it bad? Because the government has men with guns. It Normal businesses you pay them voluntarily. You want their product or service, you pay them, you got something in return. If you don't like it, you can take your money elsewhere. The government takes taxes, whether you like it or not, and then it spends them, and it enforces its laws with armed men who have guns. 
So those are all very dangerous things. There are things that you don't want overused. You want to minimize those. You know? Guns and violence and stuff, those are bad. We, we want the li li little of that as we can have. So because the government is involved in very, very dangerous things, you want it to be as small as possible. It should do the things that it's there for, but nothing else. Anything else that does not require guns, violence, etc., tax funding, um, if it doesn't require those things, just let a normal business do it that doesn't have any guns. And that's much safer, and there's much less chance of anyone getting oppressed. So because the government has like special powers, um, it needs to have the most limits on what it does so that those special powers don't get abused. So that is why, basically, I want a bare minimum government with nothing extra. No Social Security, no Medicare, no corn subsidies. All right, next topic. Industry, not environmentalism. So I'm in favor of technology and industry. I'm in favor of machines and fossil fuels and using energy and motors to replace human muscle power. Humans only have a certain amount of strength and they get tired out pretty easily. And if you use tractors and cars and so on, you can get a lot more done. And I think that's a good thing. And I'm in favor of industrial society. And I think it's made life better for the people who live in it. It's made things cleaner, healthier, richer. We're more prosperous. We have more leisure time. We have better medicine. All these things are connected and really, really good. And a lot of why science has made progress is because people were trying to make better products. They were trying to be successful businessmen and better serve the consumer. And that gave them an incentive to make scientific progress. And I think that that's a lot better than government-funded science, which is not the proper role of government. Anyway, this contrasts with environmentalist views that are very popular today, where people want to preserve nature as it is, instead of thinking about what is the best way to improve the, the situation that humans are in, they look a lot at how to leave nature unchanged. And there's a lot of uh, fear monitoring and pseudoscience. Before the global warming scare, they had a global cooling scare. Um, their weather forecasts are not very accurate. And instead of using rational arguments, they say things like 98% of the experts agree. And they try to intimidate people and call them unscientific if they dare to dissent. And they basically think dissenting from their claims is out of bounds. And even if they're right about their claims, what are their solutions? It's always less industry, socialism, more government control over the economy. They want to regulate businesses and make the world less wealthy and reduce economic activity. But... From a broad philosophical perspective, there are always going to be problems, there are always going to be things going wrong, there are always dangers. And the best thing we can do about those dangers is make rapid progress, get really, really powerful and smart and so on, you know, make the best, most awesome civilization we can, and then we're in a better situation to deal with unknown dangers. Whatever comes up, the better technologies we have, the more wealth we have, the better we're going to be able to deal with it. And you can see this with, like, tsunamis. Um, when a tsunami hits a poor country, a lot of people die. When a tsunami goes to a rich country, not very many people die. Having riches lets you deal with things like tsunamis. And it's the same with all kinds of other dangers. So we can never be perfectly safe, but we can get good at dealing with things and changing the world more to our liking, and then whatever problems come along, we can deal with them. And that is a better approach than live a more primitive life and hope no big problems ever come along. And if they do, we just die because we don't have enough technology and machines and so on to deal with it. I forgot to talk about socialism. Socialism is group control over the means of production. It means that you don't get to have control over 
ways of producing wealth. You're not allowed to run your own business. You're not allowed to be self-employed. Um, anything productive is owned by the group, not by you. So you can't really live your own life. And how does this state of affairs come about? Because right now, people do own the means of production. So it would take a massive, massive amount of violence to take all this property away from the current owners. And how would this make things better? Supposedly, the group ownership or the government ownership would make things like fair and reasonable. And we've seen historically how well that worked out in Russia and China and so on. But also, it just doesn't make sense. Currently, there are many competing businesses that own means of production and offer jobs to many different people and even compete for workers. And if if you have one single group collective owning the means of production, that's monopoly. They want to create a monopoly where there's only one employer. There's only one group that owns everything, and that's the only employer. And it's not just in one industry. They're going to own everything in every industry. And so there's only one person to go to, one group, one entity to get a job from. And that is just tyranny. That gives you no choices. And you can't even be self-employed. You have to have a job. It has to be from this one single source. So that's the worst of monopolies. A really bad idea. All right. Finally, mental illness is a myth. It is a part of the authoritarian worldview. It is a excuse used to rationalize violence and coercion. It's an attack on freedom. Mental illness is if someone behaves in certain ways that I don't like, instead of saying, oh, I don't like him or I disagree with him, I say he's mentally ill. I say it's a health issue. I say it's a medical issue. I say his brain is broken. And this justifies um, psychiatric prisons. It justifies locking him in a padded cell. It justifies involuntary commitment. It justifies drugging him. People get locked up without a trial. Sometimes for days, sometimes long term, because a psychiatrist, an expert authority, said so. It circumvents the legal system. It's very dangerous. It's not evidence-based. It is about misbehavior. It's about who gets along with who. When people behave in ways that other people don't like, when they're unconventional, when they don't fit in, when they're deviant, that is when they get called mentally ill. It is a way of attacking people for nonconformity. And it's true that a lot of nonconformity is a bad idea. Many people called mentally ill do not have very good lives. They have a lot of problems. But you know what? Everyone has problems, and they should be free anyways. One of the mantras of psychiatry is danger to himself or others. They don't want to be very clear about it. Is he really a danger to others? Is he a threat? If so... We have criminal rules for that, for what the burden of proof is, um, and for in what situations you can say someone is a, a clear and real threat and they have to be locked up even though they haven't hurt someone yet. And if you want to take someone to court um, because you know they're, they're planning a murder and you find all their documents on their computer, or they're planning a bombing and you find all the bomb materials and plans and so on, you know that's fine, but that's not what like, but that's not what mental illness cases look like. People get involuntary committed when there's there's nothing at all like that that shows they're actually going to hurt anyone. And that's why they say danger to their self or others. And they basically try to criminalize suicide and lock up people because they might kill themselves, which is their right. It's their life. It's their choice. But also a lot of these people, um, there's no actual, you know, objective evidence that they were going to commit suicide. There's no real danger. It's just an excuse. And also, some of them commit suicide because of psychiatrists, because they know they're about to be locked up or because they've been locked up and abused for a while. And when I say abused, I mean fucking tortured. Electroshock and lobotomy are still things. They just renamed them. They still do them in the U.S. today. So if this interests you, I'll... Uh, recommend some books later. All right, so who am I? Uh, where did I get all these ideas? 
I didn't want to do this at the beginning, even though it's introductory, because the ideas themselves are a lot more interesting than my own history. But I think that this helps give some perspective on where I'm coming from. So I started studying and writing philosophy in 2001. I'm American. Um, I'm a part-time freelance software developer. Uh, it's hard to make a lot of money with philosophy, so software is easier. But I prefer philosophy, so I don't work a whole lot because I'd rather spend time on philosophy. The ideas I've talked about in this video are not popular. You're not going to be able to tell your friends and have them say, oh, you're so smart, those are all great ideas. You might be able to pick and choose some that some people will like, but as a whole, um, I have shared these ideas with a lot of people, and people tend to get offended and not like them and not want to talk about them. Some, a minority of people will debate a bit, but there's usually some sort of limit on it. You know, at some point they just say, oh, that's too unreasonable, I'm not going to think about it. So why does this happen? A lot of it is because there's, there's too many controversial ideas. If you take like any one of the ideas, you can find people who agree with it. You can find people who have a perspective along the lines of me about science or about politics. But when you put both together, there's a lot fewer people who have both of those ideas. And then when you throw in the parenting ideas and the relationship ideas and the psychiatry ideas, um, it's very hard to find people who are even open to all of those ideas, who uh, think they're within the bounds of like reasonable positions someone can hold. Usually, uh, they find something that they really don't like, and they just think that that is over the line, it's too taboo, and they're done thinking. So, my intellectual influences. I got into philosophy by reading the book The Fabric of Reality by David Deutsch. Before that, um, I played chess, I did programming, I did some math, I liked science. Um, I had some interest in ideas and a little interest in politics, but uh, it wasn't very well developed. And I read The Fabric of Reality, and I thought it was really, really good, and it presented Popperian epistemology and uh, science stuff, and I was really inspired, and I started studying those ideas, and I found the discussion group where David Deutsch uh, talked about his parenting ideas. And so a lot of what I've said about parenting and education and school and relationships um, is David Deutsch's ideas. But they're not, most of that is not in his books. His books deal with science and epistemology and a bit more, like there's a little on environmentalism, but it doesn't cover everything. And so I started having discussions with him and asking him questions and debating with him. And we did that for many years, and he was my mentor, basically, for a while. So, he's a big fan of Karl Popper. Um, he got his epistemology ideas uh, primarily from Popper. So, I learned about Popper first through Deutsch's summaries, but then I also read Popper in order to learn it more thoroughly and, uh, yeah, get more details. And William Godwin is the most obscure philosopher on the list, but I studied him a lot because I really liked him. He is a liberal from around 1800, and he understood fallibility and reason and nonviolence. And um, he was consistent and principled enough to apply that to children, to understand that if the parent has a good reason, he has good arguments and reasoning, then he should explain that to his child and persuade him. And if his reasoning and arguments fail to persuade, that is a, a bad justification for using violence. Ayn Rand is, in my opinion, the best philosopher of all time. I think Popper made a major breakthrough in epistemology, and Ayn Rand is just really good at everything. So she understands a lot about politics, liberalism, small government, economics, etc. And she also talks about morality and how to live your life. And 
uh, how to be virtuous, what kind of person to be. And she wrote novels so you could see it vividly and get a lot of examples. And she also wrote nonfiction philosophy books. And she's an extremely good writer with uh, short articles and essays that are very powerful in uh, a fairly compact text. Ludwig von Mises is an economist from the Austrian tradition. He moved to America and wrote a bunch of econ books, and they're the best in the field. And Thomas Saws is the guy I learned about psychiatry from, and he's written around 35 books about it, and they're, a lot of them are pretty short and easy reads. And they're really good and can open your eyes to the problems with psychiatry, especially if you already have some pro-freedom, classical liberal type views. Because a lot of people with those views are getting psychiatry wrong right now, um, even though the principles that they already have should uh, lead to different conclusions. Thomas Saws died a few years ago. I emailed with him for about a year before he died. Um, he was open to criticism and extremely reasonable and interesting to talk to. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I've talked to a lot of people. I've written a lot of things. And most people don't care very much. It's hard to get people to care. And if they do care, they're, they get offended quite easily. And they're just not very tolerant of different ideas than the ones they're used to, usually. And everyone says that they like reason and open-mindedness and so on. Active-mindedness is better than open-mindedness, by the way. Um, it's more of the correct concept and what people ought to talk about. Because like an open mind could just passively let in a bunch of bad ideas. You want an active mind where you're looking for the truth and, and trying to figure things out and thinking about things. Anyways, a lot of people say how great that is and how, how interested in reason they are, but my experience is they don't act like it. They're not very open to discussion or it's pretty limited. If you say something too controversial, they just, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to think about it. So... It's, it's a bit of, of a, a sad state of the world, in my opinion. I find academia is some of the worst, that um, professors aren't really open to being challenged about their ideas and don't want to hear alternative ideas, which is sad because it's supposed to be, um, you know, a place of learning and curiosity and so on. I find in general the people with authority, the people with prestige, um, are worse. They got that kind of social status on purpose. They put a lot of effort into that instead of into being smart and reasonable. So I find a lot of like independent people um, who don't have like official credentials are often more reasonable, more willing to consider ideas. So if, if that kind of world situation, if you don't like it, or if you think you're different or something, um, I urge you to get involved, study philosophy, um, try to help contribute to better ideas and changing people's minds and spreading good ideas and so on. And, and don't rush into spreading the ideas. Like, really seriously try to learn them really, really well before spreading them. You don't want to be spreading the wrong ideas. You know, you want to have gotten your ideas criticized as much as you can, deal with every objection, and then spread it. So don't think that, like, you're nobody and you can't help. Um... If you're interested in reason, and you're being honest, and most people aren't, but if you are, then you could help. You don't have to be a genius. Um, there are a lot of problems with the concept of genius, but regardless, there's, there's plenty to do and not enough people doing it. So even if you don't, um, you know, come up with a great new idea, you could still help a lot just by understanding. There's, there's so much more that's known than what is, like, commonly known. There's already in existence much better ideas than most people have. Um, so the problem, the main problem is not creating even better ideas. It is 
um, organizing and explaining and sharing the ideas that already exist and, and dealing with the many, many contradicting ideas, the, the counter arguments, the, uh, the propaganda, the myths, the biases and so on. So you can find links to my stuff at elliottemple.com. Most of it's free. There's essays, a blog, YouTube, podcasts. I have an email newsletter. You can get uh, around every two weeks. You'll get some links to some of my new material and other things I like, and sometimes some short explanations or something else. Um, I have a discussion forum. If you think you have good ideas, if you're thinking of spreading ideas or doing some sort of intellectual project, run it by us. Ask if anyone has criticism. See if there are, are objections. You should seek out criticism from many, many forums, including mine and others as well, um, before you make a big investment based on something being correct. Like, do your best to find out if anyone knows that it might be mistaken in some way. I also have book recommendations in a digital store, and I'm going to show you the website. So this is elliottemple.com, and yeah, here are my different websites. Uh, Essays, book recommendations, blog, essays, essays, uh, yes or no philosophy. This is a paid product with videos and essays um, to, I think it's my best work and that it could help educate people on that topic. At Learn Objectivism, I have a close reading and analysis of some chapters from Atlas Shrugged. The Beginning of Infinity is David Deutsch's second book. And I have a website about that. Um, it has my interview with him and uh, an excerpt from the book and reviews and stuff. And the newsletter sign up. And up here, YouTube, podcast, Twitter, ebooks, discussion forum. So if you're interested, there's uh, a lot of stuff to look at. Oh, and of course, here's my email. If you have any comments, um, you can post them on YouTube or you can email me or you can go to a discussion forum. And for sources on things, um, go to the book recommendations. And so you can find Thomas Saw's books that will tell you a lot about psychiatry and mental illness being a myth and so on. And you can find um, which sections of Karl Popper to read if you want to understand his epistemology. And you can find uh, the conflicts of men's interests, the uh, it's the one with the example of two people applying for the same job and why that's not a conflict, um, the right perspective on that. You can follow me on Twitter at Curie42. There's a link here. And uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. Bye.